Romanticism is a literary and artistic movement that occurred in the late 1700s, starting around the time of the French Revolution in 1790, hitting its peak in 1820, but really lasting all the way into the 1850s. Romanticism is an, an artistic expression of liberalism. I'm, what I mean by that, and we'll talk about and define liberalism here in just a second, but what I mean by that is that a lot of the values in Romanticism are the same values that we see in liberalism, and it was just a way to express them both in literature and art. Uh, a lot of these liberal ideas, though, stop short of making real change, and we'll talk about why that was, but if you see a lot of revolutionary spirit in some of this artwork and some of the literature, just realize that all of these revolutions in the 1830s and the 1840s are going to essentially fail and we're going to not go towards liberalism during this time period but back towards conservatism. So what happened? Why did that happen? Why did liberalism initially fail? Those are all questions that we can talk about soon. So let's talk a little bit about what was going on during this time period. So the context, just as a reminder, is that revolutions are taking place. People are attempting to gain more rights. Some countries are putting into uh, practice a republican form of government. Some are attempting lots of different forms of governments, like France. And then Latin America is also trying to get their independence. So you have movements towards political power for for more people, but you also have movements towards nationalism and independence for different reasons, not just for more political say, but also to create their own countries. Uh, so revolutionary ideas are spreading everywhere. Napoleon is going to be spreading nationalism and these revolutionary ideas as he goes and conquers Europe through, the 18, through 1815. The Congress of Vienna is going to attempt to rein in this nationalistic and liberal um, and liberal ideas and put back in place traditional monarchies um, based on heredity. However, there will be some concessions and some quote constitutional monarchies that will be put in place, but for the most part these monarchs are still trying to assert at this point their divine right authority. They have the appearance of constitutional monarchies, but oftentimes in practice they are failing to include a lot of people and we can see that through the um, very small um, group of people that are actually allowed to vote and participate in government. So in, in addition to that, you see the Industrial Revolution, which is occurring, which is changing people's social and economic lives and will result in people wanting political change. So lots going on during this time period. So people are calling for change. What do liberals want? Liberals are not the United States Democrats. Classical liberalism is actually more like the US Republicans. Uh, classical liberalism is mostly middle class, uh, middle class that resulted because of the Industrial Revolution during this time period, they're called the bourgeoisie, and they wanted certain things, and I laid them out in kind of seven principles. Now, obviously not every liberal wanted all seven things, but for the most part this is what they professed. They wanted a written constitution, so they didn't necessarily want a republic by any means, um, but they definitely wanted something that was more like a republic. They would put up with some form of constitutional monarch as long as there was representative government. So it didn't necessarily have to be like what the United States had. So um, they're gonna look for a written constitution. They're gonna look for separation of powers. They're gonna look for the end of hereditary monarchies. So they want popular sovereignty. And we'll talk more about what that is. They want a republican form of government in that they want it to be representative, not necessarily democracy. They want basic rights of people protected, specifically property rights. And so they um, only want people who have property and who have what they would call skin in the game to be able to vote. They also want economic principles. They want to get rid of mercantilism and they want to have laissez-faire economics similar to what Adam Smith proposed in 1776 with the wealth of nations. This is not um, a philosophy for the peasants and for the poor. They're going to go towards more towards socialism and even communism, but this is a philosophy of the new middle class, the nouveau riche, who want 
now a voice in government because they have money and they want to protect their property, oftentimes from the poor, um, because they're going to fear them. So the spirit of the age for romantics is that initially there is broad support by romantics for the French Revolution. You see that they want to support revolutionary change, they, they romanticize revolutionary change, and they think that it's going to give the, new bourge the bourgeoisie more rights. They also see, and this is kind of a little bit of a paradox, they see individual rights as being necessary, but they see sometimes that the rise of the individual has led to alienation. And so they see that in industrial revolution and industrialization that it's become very dehumanizing. So they see the negatives um, of industrialization and that process, but they also see that people's rights need to pr be protected. So it's kind of a balancing act that they're going on. Some of the more radical um, poets and I see now that there's a typo on my screen, enjoy that, were obsessed with violent change. So a lot of these radical po political people wanted to have violent change and they wanted um, revolution. So again, support for revolution. Look at it, lights up, joy. So we're gonna go through, I think there are nine, I'm gonna try to do it quickly, um, different aspects of what romanticism portrayed in literature and art. And again, it goes with liberal values and you might wanna try to connect what liberal values are being shown. But again, emotion, passion, irrationality, which is again a reje rejection of a lot of the scientific revolution and even some of the ideas of the enlightenment. There's some concern about the dehumanization of that. And so they wanna go back to the emotion that was experienced before. They want to look back at um, the way people looked at the world prior to um, this whole scientific revolution where everything had to be explained using um, scientific principles. So there's a growing distrust of reason for romantics. They see society is good, um, and the Enlightenment has taught them that, and that oftentimes you can create a structure in society that will keep people from being violent and um, so that's a benefit of the Enlightenment, but they also see, isn't that loud and annoying, they also see that in the early 1800s with these new societies that sometimes society is not good. And so there is this idea by romantics that civilization can corrupt. So how do we improve civilization? So Rousseau was very much about you know, improving civilization through changing um, political structures. So again, this idea from the Enlightenment that society can do good and then Romantics saying, well, civilization currently is corrupting, so what can we change to make it uh, more beneficial? The um, belief of the Romantics is that the essence of human experience is actually subjective and emotional and you can't necessarily explain it using science that human knowledge is actually very um, limited and that there are greater things that we don't understand. And this is again this paradox. They want um, to protect individual rights, but they also see that if it goes too far that they can be dangerous and that the community is also important. So trying to move away from just the individual individual all the time and try to say how do we fix community to make it better for all people. Again, leading into a lot of the principles that um, some of the peasants will take out of this and some of the workers, which is that, um, well then what about socialism? What about communism? But of course, romantics and liberals will stop short of that because that then um, takes away their individual right to property. So the romantic movement, it begins again in the 1790s, it's gonna peak in the 1820s. Um, that's when Greece is having their revolution and they're fighting the Ottoman Empire and a lot of romantic um, literature and art focuses on that actual revolution as being symbolic of the struggle of people to gain their freedom and their rights. Romanticism is very strong in Northern Europe, especially in Britain and Germany. It is a reaction against classicism. Classicism, again, is a focus on Greek ideas and even later Roman ideas and 
those principles of just um, kind of order and following rules and that you need to look at things and question all the time. The romantic movement is going to look at that and say, okay, I get it, but there's more to it. There's emotion. There's things that um, we don't have to philosophize about. We need to actually just embrace. So then we have the romantic hero that comes out of the romantic movement. This idea that there, there can be an individual who um, is living this expression of romanticism, which is to essentially indulge in your individual um, individual rights and to experience the world and to maybe not follow the rules and to uh, have passion and to have emotion and to embrace those things. So there are gr the greatest example is Lord Byron, who was, for all intents and purposes, a rather um, a rake, a, a, a guy who went around with lots of ladies. He um, was spoken by women with hushed voices. I mean, he was just, he lived a debauched life. He had uh, children by multiple women. Some of them were his wives. Some of them were other people's wives. Um, and he, but he became tremendously popular. He did, had poetry and uh, wrote poetry, excuse me. And he uh, would eventually go and die in the process of, die from disease, but die in the process of helping the Greeks with their revolution. So again, a perfect example of a, a guy who just embraced this I idea of romanticism. There's his beautiful picture, made many a woman swoon. So next, the other another aspect of um, romanticism is the rugged individual. Characteristics, again, of romanticism, the idea that the individual is a dreamer, that they are unique, that their potential is endless, uh, that they can come to realization of who they are through art and uh, that artists are the true philosophers. So there is a focus, you can see it in the artwork, so I'm just going to, Caspar David Friedrich is one of the best examples. He just does so many paintings of a solitary figure pondering the vastness of nature and uh, just self-reflective. So guy looking at nature. Nature but only a single focus on a single solitary tree. So again, kind of representing the individual. The other thing that romantics uh, focus on is the power and fury of nature. Again, this, this idea that nature can't be controlled, that science isn't the answer. So they're going to glorify nature as being peaceful, restorative. Again, this is an escape from the industrialization, industrialization, industrial revolution and the dehumanizing effects of it on people but again, awesome, powerful, horrifying nature, and that it doesn't care what happens to people, sadly, and that uh, it is just something that should be really respected, maybe even worshiped, but definitely um, not attempting to understand it all because it can't be understood. So Lotharberg here has an avalanche in the Alps, and I do would like you to see the doomed figures right here. Tragically doomed that it, they are, will be no more. But again, this idea that nature doesn't necessarily care about the individual. Uh, this is a sunset after a storm on the coast and you can see it seems like there must have been a shipwreck and these guys have escaped. But just the power and fury of the sea. The Deluge by Danby, again showing people essentially being thrown about. Angel, an angel coming down to visit someone who has passed, but again, something that can't be controlled. The Tree of Crows by Friedrich, again, um, crows often represent death and just a focus on nature and what can't be controlled, which is, of course, death. The Wreck of Hope, which is also called the Sea of Ice by Frederick, again, another example of the power of nature. Shipwreck by Joseph Turner, a very well-known one. Again, a lot of people died at sea. And again, the sea was one of the great mysteries of things that people couldn't control. And then the Raft of Medusa by Garakalt, showing again the tragedy of a shipwreck. Science can be dangerous during this time period and the Romantics believed that an attempt to understanding everything could actually result in making many mistakes and um, 
trying to control nature is, is a mistake. So um, William Blake did a lot of questioning in his um, poetry about who created um, the uh, earth and the things of the earth. And I think there was a, a questioning of whether or not um, we can truly ever know and understand or should know and understand. So this is just one of his um, drawings that he did oftentimes accompanying his uh, poetry. This one's called Isaac Newton. Again, Frankenstein and this idea of um, creating that science creates something that is corrupt and wrong. Another focus which we've talked about before is that new technology is actually makes people less than human and it ruins nature. So Turner here has this um, painting called Running Steam and Speed and again these trains flew at <laughs> 25 miles per hour during this time period. It, they will get faster but um, people had never gone that fast really and so there was this incredible fear of this new technology and the train was encompassed a lot of that. I mean people did get hit by trains. They did die that way. I'm not laughing. I really am not. Um, so this rain, steam, speed, up close, you can kind of see the detail of the train, but just the coloring and everything gives you this idea, comparatively to the nature scenes earlier, that this is something that is terrible that we've created. The slave ship, slavery, is going to become an issue. You're going to have a lot of abolitionists fighting against slavery and the slave trade uh, during this time period, and, and not far from this time period in the 1860s, you're going to have the Civil War in the United States that was fought over. Um, states rights, but slavery <laughs> was one of the main components of that issue. So again, this is a time period of great social change where people are questioning, and a lot of romantics question whether or not slavery was just. So again, a more up-close view of the slave ship. Then the contrast between the dehumanizing effects of industrialization was the romantic country life. And again, this is idealized. This is not the way country life was. I mean, we've read a lot about um, death and destruction during this time period. However, it was a lot healthier. So this is John Constable. He did lots of lovely scenes where people are just enjoying the idyllic country life, the cornfield, the hay wain, which is one of his best known ones. So one of the questions I just want to pose to you is romanticism dealing with the problems of the present or escaping from it? I mean, you can see a little bit of both. So what, what are romantics opinions on industrialization? We know it's dehumanizing, but they also were, the liberals that supported romanticism were the, the engines of industry. They were the bourgeoisie. They were the ones who owned the factories. So what did they really think? They also would romanticize the Middle Ages, a time before the scientific revolution, even before the Renaissance. This idea, the Middle Ages had this mystique about them, and there was this idea that they were, um, they were just mysterious, and so there was a lot of time spent um, romancing or looking back at this time period and embracing it. So one of the favorite things is the neo-Gothic architecture style occurred during this time period, you have also a lot of medieval ruins that are favorite themes for art and poetry. So Constable did a lot of um, medieval churches um, or even cathedrals, and then a lot of medieval ruins were also in paintings by Constable and some others. You can see here, um, Highlight Castle, Constable did that one. Elvina Ruin, this one's by Friedrich again, Casper. And then the British House of Parliament, Houses of Parliament, is probably the best example of neo-Gothic architecture during this time period. So these were built in the 1840 to 1865, and they are neo-Gothic. There is also a focus during this time period on the exotic, on the occult, and romantics like to focus on the supernatural. Again, things that can't be explained by science, um, can't be explained by reason. So there's ghosts, fairies, witches, demons, a lot of these kind of things in the art and in the literature of the time period. What does this tell us about industrialization and about revolutions? I don't, there's not necessarily a clear thread, but 
there is a sense that things can't be explained. So romantics reject materialism, they want to pursue self-awareness, and they yearn to for the unknown and the unknowable. They don't necess they want to research them, want to see them, but they don't want to necessarily figure out why they're occurring. So again, ruins here by Friedrich, but notice the focus of the ruins is no longer just on um, a pretty scene, but the focus is on a cemetery. So again, death, the, the afterlife, what happens, things that are unknown, another abbey in the forest with a, with a cemetery right there. And then we have the ma mad woman with a mania of envy. This is by Garrett Kalt. Again, a piece of artwork focusing on why the cra crazy madness. Why does it happen? Why can't they fix it? The great red dragon and the woman clothed with sun. Again, this just, this, it's almost like an angel and devil and how they come together. Mighty scary. Stonehenge, which was an, uh, an ancient ruin that they still to this day are searching for how it was put together. and. Again, something that was considered a mystery. This one, scary, by Henry Fasuli. Um, it's called Nightmare or the Incubus. And there are some interesting things. Demon on this woman. And then, yes, that's a head of a horse. So enjoy that painting. Witches at a Sabbath. Again, witches and what was happening with the occult was very, um, a very an area of interest for these type of artists. And then... Again, going back to some of the old um, myths, and this one is of Saturn who um, felt that his, or believed that his uh, children were going to take away his power, and so every time a child of his was born, he ate them. This is by Goya. This is a big issue out of Romanticism, is the growing sense of nationalism, and this is what liberals are going to embrace over revolution. So we already know that revolution was something that they supported, but when it becomes too extreme and all of a sudden you have the poor and the workers getting involved, the middle and upper middle class are going to focus more on national pride and less on necessarily expanding voting rights and getting um, reforms through because there's a fear that if they go too far, they're going to lose their property. And we'll talk more about that. But nationalism was a big thing and um, Greek um, independence from the Ottoman Empire, again, focusing more on um, ethnic groups and their freedom f rather than the idea that you could be part of a larger empire. So again, during the 1800s, you're going to see the Italian peninsula come together and become a nation, and you're going to see Germany um, come together and become a nation. And the countries that don't essentially come together around a, an ethnic group and an and nationalism will eventually, after World War I, disappear. This is Liberty Leading People, which is oftentimes confused with um, the 1789 French Revolution. This is actually the 1830 French Revolution, where Charles X, who is Louis XVIII's brother, is um, overthrown, and they instill, or inst that's the wrong word, they install a new uh, king, or president, I guess you would call him now. Um, he will change that title, but they install a new leader, Louis um, Philippe, who has the popular support of the people. And so this is where you have in 1830 the change from a hereditary monarch to a monarch based on popular so sovereignty or the will of the people. Delacroix is going to paint himself into the, his own artwork. You also have um, a focus on the Carthaginian Empire and um, their freedom, that's by Turner. You have Trafalgar um, here, immortalized, the Battle of Trafalgar against Napoleon and his empire where the British were able to defeat Napoleon by John Constable. You have Napoleon spreading his empire at St. Bernard Pass by Jacques Louis David. And then you have the um, Spanish Peninsular War fighting against Napoleon um, by Goya on May 3rd, 1808 is what it's called. Then there's also an interest in exotic and foreign lands. So you've got all of this stuff about national pride and um, artwork promoting a country and its freedom from uh, empires. And then you have this uh, um, 
focus on exoticism or as we call it the sexy other so again those those other people over there the ones we don't understand and um, some people have questioned whether or not romanticism because the industrial revolution is going to lead to imperialism was actually a justification like the artwork that was created showed the immorality um, and the, the need for uh, European countries to come in and uh, give them Jesus and give them the uh, European culture or was it just an attempt to show the um, differences between cultures. There's kind of that debate going on. So this is um, the Grand Canal in Venice by Turner. Again, he's an English painter going down to Italy. And then this is um, Delacroix did some uh, travels to North Africa. And so this is the fanatics of Tangiers. And this was a Muslim sect that uh, threw themselves into, were very demonstrative and threw themselves into what Delacroix did, um, deemed epileptic fits. The Sultan of Morocco and his entourage, again, just this how these other people were living. A lot of times for people who couldn't travel, this was the way that they saw it, was through art. Women of Algiers in their apartment, again, what women looked like, how they were portrayed. And then the Turkish baths by Ingres, again, um, showing the differences in culture and whether or not this was a justification for going over and spreading the British culture, um, Queen Victoria very much felt that she needed to um, show the rest of the world uh, the proper way to live. The Charge of the Marmalukes on May 2nd, 1808 by Goya. And then this is an example in England of the architecture of India being brought over. And this is the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, which has the Indian architecture. And then I don't know if that's even numbered right. Should that be 10? I don't know. Return to Christianity. So again, a focus we talked about after the revolutions and how the Catholic Church was treated in France specifically, that there was a resurgence in um, many areas of faith. And faith in as a more private, personal thing, but also faith that was um, not so based on a church that was political. So... You have William Blake did a lot of stuff having to do with Christianity. And then Eugene Delacroix um, took this uh, myth of Faust and Mep Mephistopheles, who, and Mephistopheles was a, a demon supposedly that appeared to Faust, and Faust made a deal with the devil that he would um, trade his, his soul for um, all worldly um, treasures. And so you, Eugene Delacroix painted this. You have the Plague of Egypt, again a religious story. You've got the cathedral and some of the details of all the angels and Christianity by Friedrich. So you've got all that, Return to Christianity, and then you've got the last issue that I just wanted to mention was that it's going. you're going to have the great age of the novel. So this is where you get the gothic novels like Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte and uh, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, her sister. And then you have historical novels, um, Ivanhoe, Les Miserables, The Three Musketeers, all written during this time period. And Les Miserables very specifically focuses on the 1830 um, and the 1830 revolutions and uh, their effects on people and why people were upset. And so you get a very nationalistic novel, but also telling historical details. Um, you've got science fiction during this time period, so Mary Shelley, Dracula. Um, you also have novels of purpose. And then just some visuals in case you want to go reading something. And then there's some other romantic writers that would be helpful. The um, Brothers Grimm, Grimm's Fairy Tale were written during this time period. Um, you have Faust, which was a myth but was written again into a play. You've got Shelley, you've got Byron, Coleridge, which Wordsworth, Keats, and then William Blake as the best known romantic poets. There is a great paradox in romanticism. I just want to again bring this up. The political implications for liberals who express their ideas through romanticism is that in the end, was liberalism promoted or did they venture towards more towards political conservatism? which was the reigning view of the day, at least from the leaders. 
it's going to contribute to growing nationalism movements. The nationalism will seem to outweigh the original ideas of liberalism, which would be to expand voting rights and all that kind of stuff. It seems like the upper middle class kind of decided to choose the um, safety of conservatism rather than the unknown or the fear of going with a lot of the masses and the peasants and maybe embracing true liberal change. So you do have this time period where the concept of Volk or the people, um, again, Volk is a German word for people, and you think you can think of Volkswagen, which is a people um, mobile or people mover. So that comes out of this time period, so you've got a lot of German nationalism. Uh, you also have the uniqueness of different cultures that's emphasized. Is that going to help or hurt? A lot of people think that that might have led to a lot of the issues that are surrounding World War I which I believe is true. So romanticism is going to eventually, just so you know, give way to realism in the mid and late 1800s, which is where we get people like Charles Dickens who are no longer romanticizing the past but focusing on the present and actually possible real political legislative change for the struggles that people are experiencing because of industrialization and because of their lack of voice in government. So romanticism will give way to realism. Whose who's art and literature is realism? Well, that's a whole different question. Is it the which class of people you can decide? So that's pretty much all there is. Um, so I want you guys to take notes on um, this video that we just saw and I want you to write debatable questions. Again, you need to have at least three, but you could have more questions that could be discussed regarding not just romanticism as an art and literature movement, but what art and literature um, does for people and how they can express their political and ideological viewpoints. And there's bigger issues than just, um, you know, was this a good piece of artwork? But was this form of artwork effective in um, changing people's understanding uh, and of the world? And those are the bigger issues. So you want to write some questions and you want to make sure that you're ready to discuss. Again, you can get points for discussion. So enjoy. I know it was a long video, but there's a lot in it. This is a complicated time period.